Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thankful for your grace, for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast upon your word together. We just ask that the Holy Spirit would just take and seal to our hearts that which is truth, filtering out all of the, the ignorance and the foolishness that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I titled this uh, Wednesday night video, uh, Change Your Filthy Clothes. Change Your Filthy Clothes. It's an, 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 a complete exchange. It's not trying to keep wearing the clothes that you are wearing that become spotted and stained and then just try to get the stains out of them just completely rework your wardrobe okay i mean it's an exchange of clothes okay it's also an exchange of life it's our exchanging our life for his the problem that most christians have today is that they cling to the old man the flesh uh who they are outside of christ and it without really being uh, aware of just who they are in Christ. They continue to try to work for Christ, serve Christ, live for Christ, walk in Christ, walk the Christian life in the flesh. That garment that uh, is uh, uh, worn out, it's worthless. It's basically unusable. It's, it's completely corrupt. Uh, we're totally depraved, the old man, the uh, sin nature, we don't function out of the sin nature. We function out of a new nature. Uh, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We've, uh, we've put on Christ. We've put on the new man. We've put off the old man. Now that is true of every, every single Christian, but in our experience, it it's not, doesn't always prove to be the case. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest here, and I believe I'm correct in doing so, is, is that uh, believers who have been made the very righteousness of God in Christ continue to live in a way in which they are trying to become the righteousness of God in Christ. Folks, you can't become what you already are. Uh, you stand before God uh, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. So to, to continue on with your life as a Christian trying to become all of that is futile. Uh, it's, it's senseless. Uh, you're trying to become something that you already are. I want to start out here this evening with uh, just several verses. I, I, but I want, to, I want to talk about a subject that is, is very sensitive uh, as, as far as subjects go in the Christian you know, realm of things. Scripture declares that all sins... Of God's, all the sins of God's people for all time have already been forgiven. That's not what you hear today. You are already forgiven. Uh, the sins of all people for, for all time have been forgiven because Jesus Christ died in your place. Forgiveness happened at the cross of Christ, not after, like so many teach. It never makes me all that comfortable to take in and sort of go against what modern evangelism teaches. But dearly beloved, my, my job is to point out what the Word says, not build upon uh, some false assumptions that have already been established before. The Bible clearly says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is basically where we, we have been in our studies in Corinthians. In verse 19 of chapter 5, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Hebrews 8.12 states, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. I will remember their sins no more. And it seems to me like that in, on average, uh, sin is on the conscience of most Christians today. Hebrews 10.18 says, Now where there is forgiveness of these of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Colossians 1.20, And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Hebrews 10.12 says, But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. This means that forgiveness was finished on the cross of Christ. Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Now notice that this verse says that we were reconciled while we were enemies. Colossians 2.13, When you were dead in your trespasses, uh, I'm sorry, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. He made you alive when you were dead in trespasses and sin. Having forgiven us all, not some, not most, not just those in the past, all our transgressions. And so again, forgiveness happened, forgiveness happened before we became believers in Jesus Christ. This is what the text says. In Romans chapter 6 verse 10, verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Hebrews 9:26, but now once at the consummation of the ages, he that is Jesus has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of its unbelief. Many Christians mistakenly apply that to, to believers. We are not of the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit does not convict the believer of sin. The sin issue has been forever settled, and he doesn't convict our conscience of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. So he doesn't convict you of your individual sins since God has already forgiven and forgotten all of your sins. It's your own conscience uh, or other people or religious systems that cause feelings of guilt and remorse and regret, which I've often pointed out is the Regret is the very heart of atheism. John 16, uh, verses 8 and 9, And He, the Holy Spirit, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Dearly beloved, the need nowadays in the, in the age in which we're living, in the time in which we're living, I believe, and I'm going to, submit to you, I believe that the, the need among Christians has never been as great. I believe our Lord is returning soon, uh, when I do not know, but I believe the need for salvation is great, and I'm not talking about bringing non-believers into the circle of believers. I'm not talking about uh, transforming somehow, you know, goats into sheep or tear into wheat. I'm suggesting that the need is great now more than ever for God's redeemed people, those whom He redeemed, whom He died in their place. The need for salvation is great. God is saving His people from the sins of doubt, disbelief, law, self, Satan, uh, fear of, of death, 
And I don't believe that's physical death. I believe that's spiritual death. In a, a world religious system that's based upon human merit. If you follow this channel, you know that the way that Blessed Hope Forever defines the world in Scripture is not the non-believing world. It is always found in the context, most always found in the context, unless it's referring to the planet, it's referring to the world religious system based on human merit. That not only includes Christianity, a Christian, a Christian uh, ba uh, based merit religious system, but all other pagan religions, any religion other than authentic Christianity. He came unto his own, the word says, and his own, he's talking about Israel, received him not. John 1, 11, 1, 1, 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Same thing is happening today. Same thing is happening to the church, in the church, today. Christ is, is coming. He's, he, he's, he comes to his own. His own receives him not. Now, what do I mean by that? We don't want him. We want law. We want to operate and function out of the old man, the flesh. We want to try to overcome sin in our own strength and through our own efforts. We don't need him. Oh, we say we do. And many times, you know, we walk. In, in fact, I'm going to go as far as to suggest that in the life of most Christians today, it wasn't the case in the past, 200, 400 years ago, things have changed, dearly beloved. Things have changed. We are at a point in history now in which the church is nearing complete apostasy, a falling away from the faith that's articulated. There is a faith, a particular faith that the church has fallen away from, and that is faith, confidence in Him, not ourselves. Not ourselves. We don't have confidence in the flesh. Just like what God's redeemed people did in the, in the, in the wilderness. I'm going to put this chart up here. I made this just a week or so ago. I wanted to try to at least bring some kind of a picture, a graphic, something. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. I want you to take time to maybe take a screenshot of this. I want you to take time to really look closely at this chart. Because it is the pattern, folks, is astounding. You know, most of us love patterns. We like to see patterns. We like to see things like this. I'm not sure that many of us want to see this one. There is a pattern that the church, where that the church is seen to be involved in the same area of the physical and spiritual activity that Israel was. Just like what God's redeemed people did in the wilderness. Now, if you, if, if you want to understand this, you've got to understand that Israel, Israel, God's people, He redeemed them from bondage, from Egypt. They were led into the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for four years, a period of, of testing for the people of Israel. And God promised them that he would, he would bring them into the land in which He promised. That was, that was Canaan. Canaan. But it was not heaven. It's not heaven. Joshua and Caleb are not the only ones that went to heaven. And the rest that perished in the wilderness, well, they just went to hell. These were God's redeemed people. We can't throw out the fact that God redeemed these people. He took them into a desert. Of, of testing, of severe testing and trial, where that He provided for their every need, I mean right down to, to the, I mean, I mean everything they needed. And what did they do? They grumbled, they complained, they wanted to go back to Egypt, they didn't like what they were going through, they got tired of eating manna, they got tired of eating 
the, the, the food that God provided, Christians today, they don't like to study. They're tired of, of the same old manna. Well, Scripture, Steve, yeah, I've tried studying Scripture. It's just so dry. I want something else. I, I need something else, something to, you know, to some other experience, some other, anything other than the Word of God. The very thing that sustains and upholds us. The very thing, the very Word of God, dearly beloved, the Word of God, the thing that we tend to, to I guess would, you could say honestly, neglect more than anything in our lives. Because it's such a privilege to just to hold His Word in our hand and read it and study it and meditate on it and pray on it. We don't want that. We don't want that. No, we'd rather listen to others, get their opinions, and see if their opinions kind of match up with our thoughts. And well, that what that guy said, okay, it sounds pretty good. I'm going to go with that. I don't need to study. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a, I don't need to study. Dearly beloved, we're to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The pattern is astounding. I have a little baby picture of me when I was two years old. I was going to throw it up on the screen. I don't, I don't need to do that, but I can tell you that I look at that picture today. I'm 66 years old. I'm approaching 67. Uh, I look at that picture, and before I ever heard the name of Jesus Christ, I was a redeemed child of God. I was clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I was perfectly fit for heaven. And if I had died, I would have gone to glory, just like Paul would have gone to glory if he had died before his Damascus Road conversion, because he was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And we all had our Damascus Road conversion experience. Everyone had their, their own Damascus Road conversion. But that day in which we came to realize that we had always been His. Not that just now come to be His. Always. We were always His. And it was then and only then that our lives took on an entirely new direction. Knowing that I was His, when I came to realize that I was, and it was by grace, it wasn't by anything that I had done, that is what carried me aloft on eagle's wings. Not trying to validate th that fact uh, through some personal experience. Well, I need some outward some personal experience or something other than the Word of God to convince me or persuade me that I belong to Him, that I've always been His, and that He has my best in mind. I've often said that uh, we are redeemed, born again, in order to be saved. Redemption and salvation are not the same thing. Although the word saved, sozo in the Greek, salvation, deliverance, rescue, although that, that, that word saved can be and, and sometimes is used in reference to our new birth. Okay, it's, it's, it's interchangeable. It depends on the context in which you, where, where you're looking at. I mean, if, if, if God can say, use, God does use the word saved in conjunction with or in connection with our new birth. To born again by God from above, given eternal life, without a doubt. Okay, but, but the majority of the references concerning the word saved, because it's not redeemed, redeemed is, is, a, is an entirely different word is often seen in the context of ongoing deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. 
Christians today need saved. It was not God's intention to just redeem us and then leave us on our own to either A, save ourselves, okay, or just not be saved at all. Delivered, rescued, that's what the word means. Redeemed, bound for glory, but not saved is possible. Not only is it possible, we see in Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, that a man's entire life's work can be burned up, yet he himself shall be saved, delivered, that is, by fire, judgment. And remarkably, at that time, if that occurs, it still says each man's praise will come to him from God. That's great. Christians spend so much time worrying about things that they shouldn't, fretting over things that bothered over things that they shouldn't. Just like redeemed Israel, which God designed, crafted, engineered that circumstance, that event in history, that historical event, God designed that and did that as a pattern to, to, to us who would come and follow along later. And believe just like redeemed Israel who perished in the wilderness and, and they didn't live to see the promised land of rest rest this was a this was physical this was not spiritual Canaan is not heaven okay it was a land of rest there's your pattern so look look closely at the at the comparison why did so many of his people perish in the wilderness? Oh, well, they all went to hell. Now, wait a minute. They were his people. Why did they, they perish in the wilderness? As an example for us, this life that we live, folks, is our wilderness journey. We, we are to labor, says Hebrews, therefore, to enter into that rest. What rest? Canaan? No. Heaven? No. A spiritual rest where we cease from our own works, okay? Just like God worked six days, creation, He ceased from His works, and now you have a, the seventh day, the Sabbath, rest. We are to cease from our own works and rest in Him, rest in the perfect, finished work of Christ. When I'm reading Hebrews, I'm reading, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Are you resting in him? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest as he said as i have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise and god did rest the seventh day from all his works and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, they would not, they would, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, it's a, it's a labor. It's not easy. It's not easy to let go of yourself. It's not easy to turn your focus, your attention away from yourself to Christ above. 
It is, it is very difficult to labor to enter into his rest. It can be for many Christians, some maybe, perhaps it's easier, some it's not so easy. The text says we're to labor to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So this is a pattern, dearly beloved. We're looking at a pattern, and most Christians love patterns. I don't. It seems like they would love this one, but we'll see. The church, I submit to you, the church today as a whole is no more trusting God than did God's children in the wilderness. Most of them are grumbling. Most of them are complaining. They don't like the circumstances they're going through. They don't really see that everything that, that occurs in their lives is God's perfect provision for their lives. It's painful and as ugly as some of that stuff often can be. Most will not enter into His rest. Most Christians will not. Most will perish in the wilderness. That's why He says, Labor, therefore, to enter His rest. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing through BHF? No. Hearing through the Word of God. You will only find your need met through this book. Scripture, folks, is not telling us to proclaim what man must do in order to be redeemed. What man must do, but what Christ has done. You say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Bible teacher, or I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, you're an ambassador for Christ. You have a message. You have one life. You have a message. You have a life. What is it going to be? Is it going to be a ministry of self, uh, to self, or is it going to be a ministry of Christ, from Christ? That's the question. This isn't about human intelligence. It isn't. I, I know... I know of young kids, 10, 12, 11, 12 years old, that get this. And I know of 70-year-old pastors and Bible teachers who don't get this. It has nothing to do with intelligence or IQ or anything else. It is, the text is simply saying that we are to rest from our own works as He did from His. That's what it says. Not complicated. Where it becomes complicated is there's a wall, an automatic resistance to anything that, that goes contrary to what we have formerly been taught or what we have formerly believed. It's, uh, it's simply saying we're to rest from our own works as He did from His. It's not about your works at all, but His. You are either being delivered from sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and death, or you are not. Those who are not are those who are trusting in themselves. That's most Christians today. Those who are are those who have no confidence in the flesh. You'd be hard-pressed to find many Christians like that today. What kind of Christian do you want to be? We have to be brought to the end of ourselves. That's why we go through some of the horrible trials and hardships that we do. We have to be brought to the end of ourselves. We, we are the problem. It's hard to, to let go of that when that's what you've been taught your whole life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in, in me. God is not working, folks, to remove sin from the life of the Christian. He's working to remove the Christian from the sphere of activity altogether. Where that it is not I, but Christ. Also understand that many do teach against 
non-existent free will. We're not we're not by our, out on a limb by ourselves here at Blessed Hope Forever. Many teach that even today. Although the modern evangelistic free will error is the dominant theme. And those who are teaching that in God, God's sovereignty, who are proclaiming God's sovereignty, God's will, His perfect will, the perfect freedom that we have in Christ, I thank God for those ministries. I thank God for them. Because the light, in my opinion, the light is about burnout. We are living at that time in history. And I wasn't called to find fault with personal ministries, as you know, you'll often see on YouTube. You know, like we have to we sort of we're defenders of the faith and we have to tear down this guy, he's not teaching, you know, right, so I've just got to tear him to pieces, you know. That's not my job. And it shouldn't be theirs. Our job, our place, our work, what the reason we were put here it was to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We all learn as we study. Uh, you don't learn anything from me. I'm not your teacher. The Holy Spirit is. My job is to uh, get you to actually spend time in this book. If you don't have peace, if you don't have joy, dearly beloved, it's because you have not spent time in this book. Don't make the grave mistake of seeing, of trying to see Christ in places where he's not. You study, and I can guarantee you, if, if you have a sincere heart and you spend time in that Word, eventually you'll begin to see how that law absolutely has no place, plays no part in the Christian's life. In verses concerning our, our not being under law will be, begin to pop off the page at you you'll come to more and more realize just who you are in Christ. There's, a, there's an identity crisis occurring today, a severe one. Imagine, you know, it's, you know, you don't even know who you are or you have the wrong idea about who you are. You don't really understand just who you are in Christ. You don't understand how much God loves you. Oh, God doesn't love me. You, you don't understand just how the extent that God, that God went to forgive you of all your sins, cast him as far as the east is, the, is from the west, bury him in the depths of the sea, I remembered no more. Oh God, he's just he's so displeased with me. He's got to he's got to be holding my sins over my head like some sort of you know sort of, of uh, Damocles. Is that how you say it? Yeah, he's an angry God that has to be appeased. Folks, that's not Christianity. Our Heavenly Father is a loving Heavenly Father. Grace will force you to reevaluate and reassess what you once thought was true. It'll cause you to reevaluate, reassess what you once thought were problems. Oh, I got all these problems. Oh, you just don't know the problems, Steve, that I got. You spend time in the Word and they go from problems. They're not really, and I'll put that in quotes. They don't, they, they go from problems to God-ordained circumstances that He designed for your good. What are you going to say? Are you going to say, oh, these are all problems and they're, you know, I've just made a mess of everything. You know, God's nowhere involved in this. This is all my fault. Or are you going to say that these are God-ordained circumstances that He designed for your good. May not be pleasant, may be painful, may be devastating, but He designed them for your good. You were redeemed when Christ died in your place. That occurred in His lifetime. Then, well, you came along and you needed saved. Therefore, you were made a new creation, and your spirit was renewed. You were regenerated. That occurred in your lifetime. And dearly beloved, you played no part 
in either event. Both occurred at a time in which God chose. Not your timing, but God's. You could not initiate, nor could you prevent that work of God. And so now you are working together with God. This is where we're at in our study in 2 Corinthians. We work together with God. Your journey of spiritual growth has begun. You may, by the grace and the mercies of God, grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, which is why you were born again by God from above in the first place, thereby being saved, that is, delivered, rescued from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. Sin, that's the sin nature, the old man. Self, that's the flesh. The law, where the law is the strength of sin. The world, that is the world religious system based on human merit that which will put you to death thinking it's doing God's service. Satan, that's error and deception and the snares that he says for believers. And death, that is separation from God. You may be delivered, rescued from all that, or you may not. If you are not, because you walked according to the flesh, that is law, you will be in heaven because he died in your place. You'll be in heaven, you'll be saved again by the grace of God at the judgment seat of Christ, each man receiving his praise from God. What a loving, graceful God. Your entire life's work burn up haywood stubble and yet, not only will you be saved, says the text, but you'll receive praise from God. That's his words, not mine. Look, I love you all. I truly do rest in him. Rest in him. Until next time, thanks for watching.